Take your Bible, if you would, please turn to Numbers, chapter 13. Yeah, Numbers chapter 13. Turn there, and I'm going to start us out there. We've been here before, but uh, like I said earlier, uh, God's just been speaking to me this week through the Word of God, about hope. And uh, as we turn there, let me say this to you, what hope is not. Biblical hope, and the Bible actually gives a definition for it. Biblical hope is not wishing. We say, we use the word hope in sentences like, boy, I, I hope... Hope we get some rain this week. We really need some rain. Or, boy, I hope uh, brother so-and-so gets to feeling better. He kind of worries me. He's been sick for a long time. We use that word hope as a, as a replacement word for what we wish would happen. There's nothing wrong with wishing, per se, but wishing is not really what God wants to instill in us, what God wants to put in my heart, what God has had to put in my heart on certain occasions, what God wants to put in your heart, what I believe God would give freely to anyone who asked Him to bestow this gift upon them is this idea of biblical hope. And as, as I said, it's not wishing, it's not hoping or wishing that you, you could say, I wish I would go to heaven or I wish I could quit this sin or I wish I could get my life straightened out or I, I wish Brother Mike wouldn't preach so long or I wish I won the Powerball $1.4 billion. You imagine having that kind of money? Oh, I told my wife, I said, if I ever had that winning ticket fly in my car, and I had a billion and a half dollars, I'd buy Kenya with it. I'd just buy the whole country, run out all the wicked people, and feed those that are hungry. Amen. That's where my heart is. It's not just feeding Kenya people. It's feeding people all over the world with the Word of God. By the way, God I had a good testimony this week. Uh, number one, everybody that made these claims about the clips were lying through their teeth. Amen. Uh, but what did happen, we had a, we had a deal where we, we were going to go down south for the thing. And I got up that Monday morning, and I never, I never watched the news. And God told me, turn the news on. So I turned the news on, and I heard about them they were talking about how many buses were going to go out of St. Louis, and they had sold tickets, and they sold out in two or three days, and how many people in Jackson, Missouri, Perryville, Missouri. And I'm going, well, that's the two places I was going. So I guess maybe we'll go to Farmington. Didn't they name Farmington? I'm going, I ain't going nowhere. And I was right. When I left out of this place 6 o'clock, uh, Highway 55 and 67 both were backed up for miles. And uh, somebody said, what, it was like 10 o'clock they were still out there? Man, that was, a, I, so I would have missed out. And God just didn't want us going down there. So we were here out in the yard like we were back in 2017. And the, the American Legion Drive was backed up for hours before the eclipse. And I noticed, I don't know if you noticed this, as soon as it hit the totality of it for here, there wasn't a car to be seen on American Legion Drive. I don't, everybody pulled over and stopped. Well, some of the people pulled down in our parking lot. Now, I could have been a rascal... Because we had all of our kids out there, and I could have went over and said, you people, this is private property. You need to get out of here and leave. I didn't give you permission. I could have been that guy. But I wasn't. And we had a, a family that pulled in here, and um, I was out trying to use a mirror to show the, the eclipse and the shadow. I won't get into all that. But I walked past this family, they were parked out here, and I just said hi to them, and they said hi back, and they had brought reclining lawn chairs. They were laid back like this with their glasses on, just 
Well, after it was all done, uh, a woman comes from that family, and she's got some young ones, and she said, do you have a bathroom? Again, I could have said, we do, but it's for church use. But I didn't. I said, sure, come on in here. I said, go in there, and just right down there, the hallway there, you can go in there. And by me doing that, when she come out, she had noticed the two maps that are on the wall out here by the bathrooms. If you don't know what those maps are, those are places that we know for a fact that we've reached people. And uh, so there's a pin in places all over, Western, uh, Eastern Australia, Kenya, you see it in Kenya, other places in Africa, not so much in the Middle East, um, but in Europe, Great Britain, Canada, United States, a lot of, we got a whole United States map. So anyway, she come out and she asked me, she said, what, is, what are those maps there? And I said, ma'am, we've been streaming our services since 2011. And I said, so when COVID hit, I mean, we were like, we were there. We were already doing it. And I said, that represents the, uh, the people that God has given us throughout the years that listen in to our live services or they listen later to the recording of it. And uh, they, they think of our church as their church no matter where they live. And I said, we have, God has turned that into uh, two radio stations in Kenya, and we, we feed the people of Kenya. And she just thought that was fantastic. I don't, I've never seen this woman before, don't know her, wouldn't, probably wouldn't know her now if she came back in. Uh, but it was just one of those things where we got to be a witness to somebody of the work that God has done here. Not what I've done, I didn't take credit for it. I said, we've been doing this, we've been doing that, and God has blessed that. And so, uh, what I'm saying to you is, uh, be nice to people. Be nice to people. Okay? Uh, you'll never know. A soft answer turneth away wrath, is what the Bible says. And uh, so just kind of ponder that. Now, here's what biblical hope is. The well-founded knowing. Knowing. Not guessing. And not wishing. Your knowledge of God's hope in you is well-founded in Scripture. This is not a sideline doctrine that you can just skip over in the Bible, sort of like how you see the, uh, the genealogies, all the begattings, and when you get to that part in the Bible, you just say, okay, they begat, so what, and I move on to the, to the rest of it. No, study them and read them. There's a reason why they're there. There are no vain words in God's word. Amen? Now, just because you don't understand the meaning today doesn't mean that there's not meaning. So anyway, uh, it is the well-founded knowing that what God said he'll do, he will do. If God said... Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If God said that, God means it. And if you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, God will save you. Now, God is the one who knows whether people are telling the truth or not. I've had people lie to me. I've had people with false conversions. I've had people come in here, move. I've had families move to this church. Save that they were saved. Save that they were Christians. And the fruit of their life and the destruction that they tried to cause to this place made me realize they were lying to me all along. I know we're not supposed to judge people, but I'm pretty sure apples don't grow on rose bushes. Amen. I know that thorns do. And so I've seen that over the years. But I've also seen a church where God has brought some people together that if it had not been for the Lord in their life, their ship would have sank a long time ago. Mine included. And so I, this morning I want to instill in you, and I want God to instill in you, this idea of hope. This is, as I say, it is a primary doctrine of the Word of God. And without hope, 
I'm here to tell you, you won't make it. You won't make it. Let's read Numbers chapter 13. I have up on the screen verses 29 through 32. Remember now, this is, they sent the 12 spies, one from each tribe, to go into the promised land. They were there for 40 days to spy out the land. They came back with their report. Ten of the men came back with what the Bible calls the, an evil report. Two of the men, and we're going to see their names in a minute, two of the men are the only ones who had hope, real hope. And it, like I said, it wasn't wishing. It wasn't guessing. They heard God's word. They believed God's word. And they just believed that God was going to give them those giants to eat them for breakfast. That's what they said. God, there was going to be food for us. I don't know what giants taste like, but must not be too bad. Verse 29, the Abalakites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Does it sound like that Caleb has hope? Does it sound like that he believes what he just told everybody? Do you think that he had a problem believing what God had said? No, he believed it. He believed it so well that it was instilled in him and it was just as if he had already seen the end of the battle and saw them as vectors. It was like God, it was like God put him in a time machine and he went forward until all the enemies had, all the giants had been killed, all the enemy had been put down, and Israel was marching free into the promised land. It was like he had already seen it, but he hadn't seen it. All he knew was what God said to him through his word. And he believed it as if it were just happening right in front of his eyes. That's how well he believed that. And I'm going to ask you this question this morning. Do you, do you have that kind of trust in God's word? Think about it before you shake your head no or yes. Think about it. Because what you're saying, if you say yes, what you're saying is, I believe everything in God's word and I will act upon what God said to act upon. I will wait when God tells me to wait and I will trust when God tells me to trust. So verse 31, but the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Now I'm here to tell you that there will always be people in your life who will always seek to reign on your parade. They will always seek to destroy any faith any trust, any hope that you have in God, any hope that you have in the Word of God, any hope whatsoever. They, it's just like they are the most negative people in the world, and I'm not into positiveness and negativeness. I just know there's always somebody that's just, that for some reason, they don't trust anything, and they don't trust God, and they don't trust His Word, and they think you're stupid for doing it. How many of y'all say amen to that? Some of them are your family members. They think you're crazy. They think you're nuts. They think you're stupid for believing a book that they say was just written by men. Well, if they only knew what it is that you know. And I guess they would have to know it before they would ever understand that we, we don't just believe it. We know God's word is true. Ask yourself the question, is it possible for God to lie? It's not. Is it possible then for the Bible to be wrong? No. Let's, uh, let's read this next portion, Numbers 14, and we'll pray. 
Numbers 14, verse 6. And Joshua, the son of Nun, he had no parents. Why does it take some people longer than others to get that? <laughs> Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. Joshua and Caleb. Two out of over 600,000 men and women that believed what God said. Truly, the Lord was right. When he said, straight is the way and narrow is the gate and few there be that find it. I think it suffice to say that there are more people in this world that don't believe the Bible than do. I think it suffice it to say that there are more people sitting in a church house right now that don't believe every word of God than those that do. And what a shame for them that they have the word of God so close and yet they choose not to or they were just led by some ignorant pastor to not believe what God said. I, however, have found that the only thing that I have worth having in this world, aside from my family in this church, is the Word of God. That's it. And so, verse 7, And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will, he will, he will, underline them two words in your Bible, he will do it. He will bring us into this land, and he will give it to us, or give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people. What is rebellion in the Bible? Well, y'all know that one, don't you? What you're going to find out is that there is a different spirit in the children of Israel versus Joshua and Caleb. They had a different spirit in them than the rest of Israel. The rest of Israel had a spirit of witchcraft in them that said, rebel against God, rebel against His Word. Don't believe don't believe the, those guys telling you to go in. They're trying to get you to go in there and die. You're going to go in there and die. You're going to get killed. You're going to get slaughtered. Those giants are huge. And uh, I mean, there's no telling how tall those giants really were in the land of Canaan at that time. I mean, if we were to believe exactly what the Bible says, we have a ratio of a man to a grasshopper. That is a big hunk of man, isn't it? Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Does it sound like to you that Joshua and Caleb were, were wishing? Does it sound like to you that they were guessing? No, they spoke in, in absolutes. They knew what God said. They knew that God was bigger than all of those giants stacked together on top of one another. That God is the one who brought them into this world and God is the one who can take them out. And that that land, if God swore... Listen, this goes all the way back to Abraham. God swore to Abraham, this land is going to be yours and your seed forever. Which is why we back Israel when Palestine wants to try to take land away from God's people. Now, that may, not, that may not set well with you, and I don't care. I love you. But listen, I'm going to tell you something. God made a promise to Abraham, I'll bless him that blesseth thee, and I'll curse him that curse thee. And you won't find me cursing Israel. I won't do it. I will not do it. I'm not justifying the sins of the Jews. I'm not justifying their very satanic religious beliefs. Kabbalah is a very evil doctrine. And it is what most, what they call Orthodox Jews, it is what they believe. They are praying and getting in contact with familiar spirits. I won't get into all that. But I'm here to tell you that they are still God's people. And if God can save a Jew, he can save us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word. And Lord, Father, if this, if this helps one man, if this message helps one woman, Father, if this, if this message 
blesses a marriage and saves a marriage or saves a family from busting up. If this, mes if this message saves a soul, one, just one, it'll be worth it. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless your word, instill it in the hearts of the people as only you can do. I can only preach on the outside. It will take the Holy Spirit to preach on the inside. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would give all of us a good, a good portion of biblical hope where we just trust in you and we believe in you. And we're not going to give up. We're not. Father, bless your word to pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Now, look at verse 22 of the same chapter. God is pretty upset. And he said, Because all those men which have seen my glory... And my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times. I preached on that here a while back, about the number of times that Israel, while they were in the wilderness, wanted to turn around and go back to Egypt. They felt like quitting the moment they left Egypt and they got to the Red Sea, they stopped and they said, let's turn around, let's go back. Maybe Pharaoh won't kill us. Uh-uh, Pharaoh was on his way. He was going to kill every one of them. They turned their back on God repeatedly. God kept track of it. He said these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Now, what I'm going to tell you this morning is... If you do not have biblical hope in your life, you will not see eternal life in heaven. You will not see it. You can say, well, I've been a church member for 35 years. I've tithed. I've done everything I think the Bible tells me to do. But I'm here to tell you, the Bible says that we are saved by hope. Exact words. Exact words. And remember, it is not wishing, it's not guessing, it's not supposing. It is, a, it is an absolute knowing that what God said He will do, He will do. He made a promise to Abraham. He made the same. He repeated the promise to Isaac. He repeated the promise to Jacob. And He passed it down to the 12 tribes that God is going to give them that land. And, and we, we know that that land not only is, is the real territory that belongs to the children of Israel, but we also know that it is indicative of heaven where all of us are wanting to go one of these days. I can wish all day that I don't go to hell, but that won't save me. I can say, boy, I hope I, hope I, I, hope I die in church. Uh, that, that way I'll have a chance to get things right. Or, or, I, or, or, or th Let me tell you about this. There are some People, and I've heard them say this, that when the subject of hell is brought up, it's like they have already reconciled in their mind that they're going to hell and that there's nothing that anyone can do about it. They can't do anything about it. And so they just, they've just kind of made up their mind. Well, if there is a hell, I guess I'll be going there. And what they don't understand is they don't have any hope in mankind, they don't have any hope in themselves. And they do not have or do not know how to have hope and trust in God. Because I believe that God can save the worst sinner you can imagine. Turn, them, turn their life around and they'll be in glory waiting for us to get there one of these days. Let me hear you say amen. My brother-in-law is a testimony to that. I tell everybody that comes to visit this church, if I take them up there and show them... Area 52, I got his picture in there. I tell him about my brother-in-law. How, how he lived his life and, and the depths of the sin that he was in. And, and how hopeless it looked for him to be saved. And yet one day sitting in a jail cell, 
He, there was even a song that came out, he, he, and that was his song. I found Jesus on the jailhouse floor. That was his song. Because he got down on his knees while he was in jail and said, God save me. And he got out of jail and I baptized him. And I saw God, you know, I, I saw that he was still struggling with the old life. And no matter what I did, I couldn't change that. So I just kind of backed away. And when I saw him come to that family get together one time, his face was just pale, carrying an oxygen bottle. I thought, man, he's dying. And I prayed a prayer one time. I said, God, before he dies, will you have me there by his side? Because I've got to know whether or not he's going to heaven or not. God answered that prayer better than I prayed it. Next thing I know, he's sitting there next to his mom and dad with his Bible in his hand saying, Amen. Amen. And I'm going, that's a four-letter word I've never heard him say before. And God changed that man's life. And I know where he is right now. I don't just guess it. I know it. He came to me that Sunday morning and said, Mike, how will I know for sure I'm going to heaven? He wanted hope. He wanted biblical hope. He, he, he didn't say, I don't want to guess at it. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. And that Friday he went. And I just, I smile when I think about how good God was to that awful, hell-deserving sinner. If God can save him, if God can save a Jew, he can save anybody. Don't give up on people. Now, let me put this in the context of those who, this has sort of been the theme. Those who have struggled with addictions of various kinds. I know it for a fact that when you are in the throes of addiction, you do not see any hope of ever getting out of that and being free from it. You do not see it. And this is why I believe it, it causes most people who have addictions of various things, rather than turning away from it, they seem to turn more into it just so that I think some of them actually hope they will die. Rather than going through another withdrawal episode. Rather than going through having to beg, borrow, steal, or do whatever it takes to earn money. Women selling their bodies just to get enough money for the drugs that they can't live without. The alcoholic, the drunk, who cannot see a life without the bottle. He has lost hope. And many of those people, because they think that they're, they're, they cannot see a life of sobriety, it causes them to give up. Give up. Giving up is absolutely the worst thing anybody can do. In fact, let me just... Um, I've got a verse here in my mind. I don't know exactly where it's at. Uh, it says, a just man falleth seven times. Where is that at? Does anybody know? Where's my mouse? I hope I find it before you do. Proverbs what? 24, there it is. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. Notice the two people. A just man, when he falls, he has hope. He has hope that just because he blew it today, God will raise him up, help him to stand up again, and try it again another day. He's not about to give up just because he fell again. And God said, you can fall seven times. Seven times. Get back up again. Let's start all over again. Let's try it again. I think God would make an awesome cheerleader. A male cheerleader. 
He's saying to us, get up. Come on, get up. I know you fell. I know you did it. I know you, I know you uh, went back to it. But get up again because I'm telling you there's coming a day when I'm going to deliver you from this. I'm going to take this out of your life and you'll never have to. You're, I'm going to do with your sin and your addiction like I did with Pharaoh. I'm going to take you into a new land and you'll never see Pharaoh ever again. Let me ask you a question. Would you like that in your life? See, I know you would. But the weight of our own sin keeps us to where I don't think I can do it. And you know what? You're right. You can't. But I know the God that can. I know the God that has. I've seen his work. Not just in other people's life, but in mine. I've seen it work. I know it works. So when it comes to a just man falleth seven times, well, that would be me. And that would be you. But bless God, I believe so strongly in God, and I'm not, I am not boasting of my faith. So forgive me if that's what it sounds like. But I have learned over the years that I have a God that is full of second chances. I'm going to tell you the story about my son. About this time last year, I had to put him out. He's of age. And his life was in a downward spiral. He watched the girl that he loved, that this young lady was really doing him some good because he was coming to me and Lisa all the time asking for advice. He'd come to me and ask me, Dad, I don't understand women. I'm going, me neither. <laughs> he watched her die in a car wreck. And to soothe the emotions that he, feel, that he felt, he got into marijuana. And at that time, it was just, it was just bound to happen. He was, he was staying so high all the time. He just couldn't think right, couldn't drive straight. And so we found in the wrecked car... We found the jar of marijuana, a jar, a whole jar full. And we left it in the car. We didn't want anything to do with it. And I confronted him about it. And he acted like it wasn't a big deal. He went and retrieved it. And I had told him, you're not going to drive around in my car with this stuff. You better get rid of it. He said it was a friend of his. I didn't believe him. And so, a couple days later, I found it in my car. And I went in, and I put him out right then and there. I said, get out. You pack a bag, and you go. You're not going to do this in my house and my car. A couple of months of being the prodigal son and feeding off the hog slop of the world, he called his mother Sunday morning, 4 o'clock. And he told her, he said, I'm tired of sleeping in my car. I have no place to go. I can't stay with anybody. I'm tired. God had hardened my heart and made me as an adamant stone and I wasn't budging. Um in my position but when he called that was Sunday and I'm thinking okay Mike you're going to go to church be spiritual but neglect your own son not going to do it so I prayed about it all day and I told him to call me so that afternoon he called me and I said I'm going to ask you one question are you wanting a bed and a shower 
so you can go to work every day and have a place to sleep at night and shower to clean up with? Or do you want a second chance? And that threw him. He was not expecting that because he didn't say anything for about 10 seconds. And finally he said, I want a second chance. And I told Lisa earlier that day that that's what I was going to offer him. Because God had told me, Mike, how many second chances have you had? More than I want to count. So I would have been the biggest hypocrite in the world to receive grace from God and other people and not give it. <clears throat> it's been a year since he came back. He is now working as a foreman in the company that he works for. He's always loved working outside with his hands. And he is making good money. His attitude at home has been significantly different. I've seen a change in him. We went out, just me and the boys, to a hockey game the other night. And when we got home, before we went inside, I said, Caleb, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I've seen a big change in you. And I said, I want you to know your dad's proud of you. He wasn't expecting that either. The worst thing I could have done to him was to instill in his heart that no matter what he did, no matter how straight he got his life, and no matter what he gave up, no matter what he stopped doing, no matter what he started doing that was right, that it wouldn't make any difference with me and for him to have absolutely no hope that his and my relationship would ever be knit together again. The worst thing I could have done to that young man was to give him hopelessness. Because when you get to a point where you think that no matter what I do, it's not going to get any better. No matter what I do, no matter how many times I pray, no matter how much money I give to the church, no matter, no matter how many times I read my Bible, no matter how many times I listen to Pastor Mike or how many sermons I preach, no matter what I do, it's never going to make any difference. That's the worst sickness that somebody can have is hopelessness. It'll destroy you. And you'll give up and quit. Now... Let's see, where'd it go? There it is. Look at, uh, back in Numbers again, verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, look at that, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. How would you like Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, how would you like for the hope that God has put in you to spill out on your children and your grandchildren so that your children and grandchildren down to third and fourth generation serve God and love Jesus and believe the Bible, amen? That kind of hope is what I'm talking about. If you've got lost kid children that are not serving God, how dare you give up praying for them? How dare you give up? How dare you say, well, they're too far in sin. They've gone too far. They've gotten too bad. I don't think they'll ever come. How dare you do that? God didn't give up on you, did he? And he still hasn't given up on you, you old rat. Yeah, I'm talking to you. You just don't know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to all y'all rats. God did not give up on you. And he's not going to. God put a different spirit in Caleb. That's the difference right there. He had a different spirit in him. Now, here we go. We're going to go through. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm turning my Bible there. Even though I have the scripture right in front of me. I'm going to live by example. Ephesians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. 
First and Second Thessalonians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Look at verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You were dead, and dead people have no hope, do they? Dead people have no hope. When you are walking according to the prince of the power of the air, you will never have hope in God. God has to give it, give it to you through, through the preaching of his word or reading of his word, or hearing of God's word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Receive ye the spirit by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith, Paul said in Galatians. And right here he's telling you there's two, dif two different spirits. You can be quickened by God's Holy Spirit and made alive again and live with a lively hope, the Bible says. A lively hope. That means that your hope is not dead any longer. The Bible says, and I don't, I don't think I put this in my notes, the Bible says that God, uh, I think it was, uh, I can't remember who it was, David, in Psalm 22, he said, God has made me hope upon my mother's breast. He said, when I was first born, God put hope in me. Because he gave me a mother that was going to keep me alive through those weaning years. So Ephesians uh, 2 verse 11. And wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh. Made by hands. That at that time ye were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. And strangers from the covenants of promise. Having what? No hope. Your sin buried any hope that you might have had of having a better life. How many, I wonder how many, how many men out there who've lived up in their 50, 60, 70 year old look back on their life and they regret living the way they did. They destroyed themselves. They destroyed their family. They destroyed any any way of having hope whatsoever, and they feel like that they've gone too far and it's too late. I'm here to tell you it's never too late. Old Buster Montgomery, some of y'all remember him. Him and his wife come to church. She was a, a good, good, saved church lady. She was a Baptist, and so they started coming here. They moved over by the hospital because he had cancer, and he'd come with her. And there'd be times old Buster would stand up. I'd ask for testimony. Buster would stand up. He'd just tears in his eyes. He was a World War II veteran. And he would talk about how he just loved this church and loved the people in this church. And how they, this first time he came in, they just loved on him. And he just loved it. 77 years old. And he asked me to come to his house one Saturday. And he said, I just need to know how I'm going to heaven. So I gave, led him down the Romans Road of Salvation. He asked Jesus into his heart. And as soon as he got done praying, he said, okay, now I figure I've got to be baptized now. When's that going to happen? I said, well, hang on, hang on, I've got to fill the baptistry, all right? I mean, that man got saved, and he, at 77 years old, he didn't think it was too late. That's the worst thing you can do, is think that you've gone too far, and it's too late, and not even God can help you. What a shame. Having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus... Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by what? Not by your own self-will, not by your own effort, not by your own works, but it's by the blood of Jesus Christ that you are made nigh to God. You're no longer at war with God. God's Spirit reigns in you, and you've got hope. And you're not about to give up. I tell you what, I've... Sometimes I get, I get a bad attitude and I feel like this country's done for. And Then I say it, there's no hope for America. Wait a minute. God saved Israel. Why couldn't he save America? And when America turns around it won't be biden or trump or any of them other guys it'll be the lord jesus christ bringing revival to this land but it's got to start in the pulpits first first thessalonians 4 turn there first thessalonians 4 is where the the rapture 
And he's going to address that after this in verse 16 and 17. But he says in verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He's talking about those that have died already. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Let me tell you something. I've preached enough funerals. I've been to enough funerals. And I've had to stand in front of a casket of somebody that I figured probably more than likely was in hell right now. And to preach their message and preach their funeral in such a way as that I do not preach them into heaven and give somebody a false hope. Because I listen to the people that go by the casket of these people that cared nothing about God, cared nothing about the Bible, cared nothing about church in their life. And the people that walk by their casket saying, well, they're not suffering anymore. Well, they're in a better place. Well, they're with grandma. I don't know, grandma may have been a moonshine <laughs> granny. But everybody that walks by that casket looks down at that old rat down in there and says, oh, they're in heaven now. They're with so-and-so and, -so and uh, they're not in suffering anymore. I'm going to tell you what, they're screaming. They're hollering to the top of their lungs. Oh, I want out of here. And they're never going to get out. That's when you stop having hope. Because those that have died already, there is no hope for them after that. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this, the judgment. And if you think that God's going to give you some kind of special administration or dispensation that when you die, he'll give you a second chance, that's the devil lying through his little fang teeth at you, trying to convince you that you can live however you want to, deny God, deny the word of God, deny holy living, and still God's going to give you a chance after you die to, to come into heaven. I'm here to tell you that when, when a sinner dies, there is no hope for them. And Paul said, I don't want you to be like them. I want you to know that if, if, you're, if your granny was a godly saint of a woman and she read that Bible and she believed it and she walked the walk and talked the talk, I'm here to tell you there's hope that you're going to see her again when you march into heaven. You're going to just say, hey, come on, Meemaw, let's go. Amen. I said that because I got Meemaw. And I believe I know where she is. And I'm going to tell you something. The worst thing that anybody could say over a sinner at a funeral is they're, they're passing on this idea that, well, if, if I put it in my mind that they died and went to heaven, then surely I'll go to heaven. I'll still live the way I'm going to live, and I'm not going to give any moment to church. I'm not going to church. I'm listening to some stupid preacher. I'm not going to read the Bible as written by men. I'm going to live the way that person lived because I think they're in heaven. I'll, and listen, I'll tell you something. That's a false hope. You've got your hope in the wrong place. Turn to 2 Corinthians 1. I'm going to quit here in a minute. I'm not done with the message. <clears throat> I'm preaching to you this morning that have thought about quitting. And I don't mean quitting smoking or quitting drinking. I mean quitting, period, whatever it is. You've got to the point where you've given up. You've lost hope. I'm here to tell you if I would have given up when things got hard, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have been here yesterday. I just wouldn't be. <clears throat> but I had to have help. I've had help from my wife. I've had help from my daughters, my sons. I've had help from my mom, sister. I've had help from people in this church. At times when I wanted to quit, times I wanted to give up, times I wanted to walk away, in fact, this whole ministry that we have represented on those two maps out there are a result of a time when I was ready to give up and quit. 
And God turned it around and said, I got something better for you. And it, this is a gift from God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. And our hope of you is, what's that word? Steadfast. What does it mean to fasten something? Put it in place, nail it down, it ain't moving. That's where your hope needs to be. Nailed down, glued down, cemented down, anchored down. Hope is our anchor, the Bible says. So, you have hope that is unmovable hope. You are not going to put your hope anywhere else. The woman who came to Jesus with the issue of blood for 12 years, she came to the Savior. Why? Because she had hope that doctors would heal her, and no doctor could heal her. She spent all of her money on doctors, and they couldn't fix her. She went to the one. It was her last hope, but it was the right hope. She touched the hem of his garment. She was healed instantly. Jesus knew that virtue had left him. He turned around and he says, Why'd you do that? And she admitted, I did it because of this and this and this, and I've spent everything, and you're the only hope I've got. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If Jesus is your last hope, that's the best one. God will save the best for last. Amen. And I, I mean that because once you find Christ and instill His hope in your life, you will not turn around and go after anything else. The people that have left church, the people that have turned their back on the Word of God, the people that have done that, that I've seen them do it over the years since I was a boy in this church, watching people walk away from the Word of God, walk away from church, walk away from God's offer of free salvation. To turn into sin, into worse sin than they've ever been in. I've seen people do it. And I'm here to tell you, that's no life to live. You need hope. And our hope of you is steadfast. Knowing, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia. That we were pressed out of measure... Above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. That word despair means hopelessness. It means that in your mind you've given up. You see no way out. And so you just hope to die. That was me, April 1st, 2006. I knew that I was being electrocuted. I knew I wasn't breathing. And I knew I was going to die. And after I had prayed my desperate prayer to God, I waited to die. I cannot describe the feeling of that. I cannot... I don't know how to express it. But to this day, I don't like thinking about it. To wait for an assured death is something not too many people face, I guess. I don't know. But I gave up. I gave up. I was waiting to die. And I'm glad for my wife, all my children, and all my awesome grandchildren. Hunter played his first soccer game yesterday. They won 6-1. to one. I just wish he'd play football instead of soccer. <laughs> but I would have missed out on all that. I would have missed out on all y'all. I'm glad God didn't give up on me. Despaired even of life. Here's the Apostle Paul saying, we just decided we we're going to die and that's how it is. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which what? Raiseth the dead, who delivered us. L look at this verse. There are three deliverances who delivered us past tense from so great a death and doth deliver present tense 
And who said he will yet deliver us. When God saved you, he saved you out of the past that you had lived in. He saved you for the present day that you're in. And he saved you for the day when you're going to stand before God and give an account of your life. And when they open the books and you look in and there, you're waiting for them to call out all your sins. And the angel says, Lord, there's nothing here. The blood of Jesus has covered it all. Woo! Amen. Oh, I kind of wish we was charismatic a little bit. This is joyful stuff. This is the kind of hope that you and I need to have in our lives. And our family members and our friends need to see that in us. They need to see hope. Let's bow our heads this morning. I want to give you the opportunity. I got in trouble last Sunday from Sister Ray Lynn back there. She come up to me and she said, Why didn't you have us come down? And I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about? She said, at the end of your message. I went, oh. I said, I will next Sunday, for sure. I'm going to open up the altars this morning. For those of you who need hope, for those of you who have given up, from those of you who have decided that no matter what you do, nothing's going to change.